KTLO, 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 keeping the learning on. It is just spectacular to be here. It's Friday again. It's episode Happy Friday. 16. 16 episodes, folks. It's it's, it's like Freaky we Friday. do these episodes and the numbers go up. It's yeah. just wrong. <laughs> I do not understand what is going on there, but you know. I'll explain it to you later, Roy. Yeah. So uh Sweet Sixteen. Yeah. Well, it is sweet sixteen, isn't it? Yeah, sweet um, sixteen. So I'm sharing, and what am I sharing? Am I sharing my web browser right now? You're, Is that you're, what you're actually seeing? sharing your screen at the moment. It's not actually doing the full play. Yeah, that's, oh, no, you know, no. yeah there we go. That, that's right. just a... What is up with that? I don't understand it. Anyway, because uh, I select the application deck. I want to share. This is just the way it goes. That's the way play it goes. Deck. All right. Play deck. Play deck. Play deck. Play there deck. you go. Play deck. Play deck. So well, here we buddy. are. Uh, keeping the learning on episode 16 and today's episode has a rather fascinating title does it not it does, it does. Uh, there's our title no that's not our that's... Title today. <laughs> this is us uh patty blackstaff greg sanker simone joe moore and yeah, i'm still in the car yours truly you stick it right you're always in the car what is yeah. that I'm always in the car you're just drinking wine because it's the afternoon in france <laughs> It's Friday and, uh, afternoon. It's Friday afternoon. Why not? And so by the way, not a fake background. Not a fake background. The real deal. Real Mine's deal real background. too. Mine's it's real too. That's because I'm the real deal. It is neither digital nor delusional. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I might be delusional, but it's still the real deal. <laughs> but the but on the other hand, Simone, the reality distortion field does travel wherever you go. So correct. Exactly. That uh, you. Some of you may recognize the reality distortion field uh, phrase, which uh, was initially applied a lot to Steve Jobs at Apple, uh, who could you know, s- sell you a matchbook and tell you that it was the most advanced piece of technology on the planet. <laughs> uh, and so it's like, well, everybody's got that. Oh, but Apple, you know? So, uh, and, and we're gonna talk about how that applies to certain phraseology that is trundling around the business world a lot. And we're going to talk about why that is and what we think about that. And just to remind you, this is not a webinar. It's not a session, really. It's, it's an episode. <laughs> it's an episode. It's an episode. <laughs> it's an episode. <laughs> and basically, this is a, a conversation that we've been having for a long time. And uh, we're making it public just because... We decided to do that. We decided and we to do it. It would be fun. And, and thanks, we, thanks for. I the, like the. I like that you say. I like the way you say a long time, which means that yeah. you don't have to admit exactly how many years this has been going on. I was twenty eight when we started this conversation. <laughs> no, you had dark hair when you started this conversation. <laughs> Ow, I had uh, hair when we yeah, started this conversation. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Not even. Wow. Not well, I think we're close. on point tonight. <laughs> no, I think we're delusional tonight, is what I think. <laughs> See, there you go. All right. Well, let's, and some let's... of the delusions are happy ones. So Goodness. let's not discount what? being under a delusion. Let's Patty, it could, it could be good time. for your mental health. Patty oh, Blackstaff. Look who's here. We got guests. We're going to have to put on our good behavior now. Yes, we have to behave ourselves because oh, Mark dear. is here. Hi, Mark. Now, if anyone wants to talk about, you know, distortion. <laughs> that, that's a distortion that, right there. That, that is I a distortion right there. If you guys want me to. <laughs> Good morning, no, Mark. No. <laughs> hey, Mark. Hey, Mark. And I thought that, you know, thank you, Simone. I thought that would that would fit my MO. So, yeah. I'm good. Absolutely. You do it every single year. Every time you do the beard back to the DJ look. I mean, you know, seriously, that's a, that's a, that's a distortion. <laughs> But Mark, you don't you don't really look substantially different with the beard. I mean, you look different with the beard. Every guy does. Yeah. When I shaved my beard off once about thirty some odd years ago. Yeah. I was going to be the best man in a wedding, and uh-huh. I said, "Well, if I'm going to shave, I might as well do it now." It was a couple of weeks before because then I can always grow it back if I don't like it. Right. Yeah. So I shaved the beard off, and th- that night I'm out with the woman I was dating at the time. And the bride and groom come into this bar. They didn't know I was going to be there. I didn't know they were going to be there. They walk right past me. And uh, (laughs) the woman I was dating, her name name was Mary. And I'm sitting at the bar with her. 
And they go around the corner of the bar and I see Chris, my friend, lean over to his bride to be and say something. Yeah. Later on, I come to find out what he said was, I don't know who that guy is with Mary, but if Roy comes in here, he's going to kick his butt. <laughs> <laughs> he had no idea who I was whatsoever. Oh, that's brilliant. Oh, I, oh, I, I, I scared that, that, the dog. That, that was, yeah. Oh, uh, you know, that was like my father-in-law, you know, for, for his daughter's wedding, uh, because, you know, he had the whole salt and pepper and looking rather distinguished and everything else. But he used to have the old comb over, mm. you know which is like just this. anyway yeah yeah the comb over is never a good look uh, especially when you've been in the ocean and you walk out and it's like <laughs> anyway so <laughs> he, he thought you know he didn't want to look so old at his daughter's wedding so he decided that he would you know had did the home the home coloring thing oh and decided God. to do the, the the brunette but he left it in for too long <laughs> So oh at God. the wedding, the photos in and he's walked and everyone's going to go. Yeah, a WTF moment, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll start growing it out when it gets cold out. Yep. That's the deal. Anyway, thanks, thanks no, my we'll dad always guys. said the beard, it was always good for catching the crumbs. So when you're oh. hungry later, and yeah. That's later a solution. Yeah. Hey, uh, he was a depression child. So, you know, that was the thing. Oh my God. <laughs> And by that, you mean era, not as in the state. era. No, yeah. I, yeah, was as a, in the I was era. a depressing child. That's, yeah. a, that's a whole different thing. <laughs> See, delusion, oh, distortion. Oh, We're yeah. already on topic. Absolutely on our topic. delusional episode. <laughs> yes. Wow. So, so we have never you, done this before. This is a total new setup. Oh, boy. Yeah. We didn't discuss this in the press. This meeting, is not guys. discussed, right? <laughs> I blame Mark. I totally blame Mark. Oh, my gosh. I'll just listen <laughs> no. to it. Thank you. I'll just stick to the rosé. Thanks, thanks, <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for coming on, Mark. No problem, guys. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. thanks for letting me listen. Sure. So uh, one of the things that occurred to us as we were talking about this topic a little bit this week uh, was uh, what tends to happen in the technical world and yeah. in most project world, it's not, it's product design, it's technology, purchases, Show of hands. it's everything. Show of hands, who has not seen some version of, of this slide that, that we have on the screen right now? Yes, I know and everybody. And hopefully you're okay, looking Sanka, in the Okay, I'm just going to say like show of hands. <laughs> it doesn't quite work on this the way this is set Hey, <laughs> it's a digital world. They can show hands it's a by- a digital world. Yeah, okay. By hitting yeah. the hashtag on Twitter. That's- You just hit a distortion you. there. I, I know. <laughs> Thing is, we're very familiar with this, right? Yes. Um, and, and you know where this is going to go, but I think we're going to talk about kind of the steps that we use uh, to get there, are we not? A little bit. Yeah, this, is, this is not your traditional- uh, improvement process orientation style view of this cartoon. So it, it, it isn't, it's a little more ver verbose. So, th th so somebody, and this is interesting because we don't know whose perception this is, but somebody believes that, that that's what the customer described, that they had two ropes and three different levels uh, on there, right? We don't know who who believes that the customer said that. That's it's not necessarily a fact that the customer said that. It's an interpretation. It's a, exactly, and there's where we start getting into uh, the distortion piece, um, because then, of course, everybody knows the, the the darn budget folks never give us enough money to deliver the product that that the customer actually asked for. But we all know that the engineering department is going to do something just tremendously silly and design a product that's not even functional. Uh, yeah, but that's because they stuck to their interpretation. Exactly. Of what we are engineering in friends. <laughs> Yeah, and most of my most of my friends yeah. are engineers, and that's why I can really kind of kick them around <laughs> like that, right? <laughs> I mean, my uh, brother's now, a PhD, well, on, and that guy see? can't. It, that guy can't do anything practical to save his but, life. But no, which no I'm looking is, at that. What the engineer designed is not necessarily impractical, though, because I can actually see myself being able to sit under this gorgeous tree in the summer back. afternoon and lean back against the tree. Right. And exactly. I'm quite comfortable and happy there. So but it's you, not necessarily or swing, wrong. But you or are swing. But, but you but can you, only swing once. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> but you. 
but you already see the problem because in these three slides, and we've got you know uh, uh, six more to go. In these three slides, you already see a disconnect between the various perspectives on whatever it is that we're trying to do. Right. So yeah. manufacturing, recognizing that the engineers did it wrong, they decided to install it like this. So at least I, it I, okay, stop functional. right there because my my you know my amygdala is just like I'm getting a hijack looking at that one because this is like. <laughs> Shit, uh, it depends on. Oh, did I say that now? Uh oh, uh, anyway, that was an Aussie thing. Sorry, I apologize to anyone that doesn't like swearing. Um, but it that was my amygdala reaction when I looked at that because that's like, wow, uh, what is your relationship and acceptance level of risk? Because that's what I, when I look at that one. That, that's well, that's, that's inter- inter- off my risk buttons. That one, but well, well, it is, but you've you've also uh kind of had a, a environmental travesty right because uh, yeah. we we now know that that tree is non uh non-functional that can't be restored um but I, I love the middle slide right there uh marketing advertised whatever it is that we're going to work on and it's the only slide that has the sun shining and beams of glory <laughs> coming through and it's not just that it's a swing that you could sit on it's a swing that's comfortable and padded and you can put your arms it, it doesn't have drink holders that's i have problem. seen you in that yeah. mode right i know fireplace and in that type of chair and being glorious know. right yeah being glorious yes <laughs> well, and the moving yeah, the on <laughs> <laughs> yeah the yeah. reality actually smoke. does exist yes <laughs> but we we also know we also know over to the uh, to the far right there is what actually got documented was not a darn thing, right? Because nobody nobody does documentation, especially in okay, our field. To a KM like me, yeah, <laughs> that 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 is like that's a that's a death knell photo. That's like. Yeah, it's yeah. also a stereotype. So let's quickly go through the last three. So we've gone through the first six, the the two words that are really important to understand. One is perception and the other one is uh, interpretation. Yes. And those, both of those are defined by the level of commitment and communication that is going on with you, with, with the team or cross-functional teams, right? Right. Right. So, so yeah. All right. So what the customer finally received was kind of not actually too far off, although not functional. It had the the basic elements. What we build the customer for, right, was, you know, uh, a whole uh, theme park. Yeah. Theme park of, thank you. <laughs> um, and then what the customer actually wanted was actually rather quite simple. It's just to just tie a rope around a limb and I can swing back and forth on it. All right. I was so actually this- just thinking about my older brothers and how they treated me as a kid. So that one on the, you know, on the left, what the customer finally received, I think they were rather inventive with that style of when they got that kind of thing. Aren't and- you supposed to put your sister in the swing and then throw it around just as far and as fast as you possibly no, no, can? No, no, no. These were the type of brothers that tied me yeah. to a clothesline and swung me around because I felt like I wanted to be a fairy one day and then you left know- me there for two hours crying mum. So. You know- what you do you know, in your they're, spare they're, time is really up to you. Yeah, I know. But I mean, I mean, but you know, think about it because this is how the customer feels. It's like, exactly. this is what I wanted to do. This is like, I wanted to have this experience. So um, for those of you who don't, I mean, okay, okay, look at, you know, watching the Brady Bunch or something. And Cindy one day was in this play and she got tied to the thing across the stage and became a fairy. And now here I am in Australia and I saw this episode, the Brady Bunch. I went, oh, wouldn't that be so cool? I could like, you know, and fly. So, and, and in Australia, we had the Hills hoist, this metal Hills hoist for a clothesline and it, it swung around beautifully. So I said to my brother, I said, oh, that would be so great for it. So they did exactly that. They tied me to the clothesline and swung me around, did it two or three times and then ran away. Two hours later, I'm still crying mum. Now that, and I'm not, no word of a lie is exactly the same emotional experience. I have heard customers like this, what, you know, so after experience, what they got delivered. Perception and interpretation does not equal experience. Ex- yeah. It also, it's it also doesn't, so- it also doesn't equal reality. No. And that's, Just that's one of the things is if you, clear. if you look at, if, if you look at the slides, don't go back, Roy, uh, we'll keep moving forward. But if you look at the slides, there's there's a vertical line and there's also a horizontal line between each of the individual boxes. And you immediately recognize that 
everybody, quote unquote, everybody thinks that the engineers are all impractical and, and theoretical. And everybody knows that the budget people are cheap. And everybody knows that marketing is going to oversell it. Stereotypes and stereotypes, fragmentation, silos, we're all operating based on our own perception. And when we're talking about digital transformation, which is part of what we're going to talk about today, is all of that is gone. It's evaporated, right? It's a very integrated and horizontal that also includes integration with your customers in ways that we've not seen before. Right. It's, it's chopping up the hierarchy and making this interdependent solar community in order to achieve transformation. Yeah, yeah. write that down and put that on a meme because that is exactly right, Patty. <laughs> and I think that needs a sci-fi meme at the back of it. Because, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But here's how the here's how the telephone game gets started, and uh, to I, I I was for a while when I was talking about this, doing presentations on on this stuff. I was uh, I used to refer to it as as the Google effect, but there is a book called the Google effect, and there's some other stuff called the Google effect. So so for this for my purposes now, I call it the SEO effect. And and what I mean by that is if I'm writing an article about changes in business that are taking place now. I really have to mention two things, one of which is digital transformation. I have to put those words in there. And the other one is artificial intelligence. I have to put those words in there. Why do I have to put those words in there? Because of, of uh, SEO. Yeah. To bring my rankings of my posts closer to the top. So Got to get the traction. Ad, exactly. Everybody is talking about those things. And, and whatever the hot topic is, you know, whatever's on the on the magic hype cycle, that's what has to get talked about. Then what happens? You must talk, therefore, talk about this in order to show that you're current. You know, you have to relevant. Do that. Um, this 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 is also I will just mention, and I won't go further into it. Maybe we'll do an episode on corporate jargon and, yeah. and let Roy off his chain uh, about that. <laughs> but this is also the cause for corporate jargon. Yeah. Well, Absolutely. he calls it the spend. He doesn't call it expenditures anymore. He calls it the spend. So we have to call it the spend now. Yeah. Okay, great, whatever. Um, so right now, everybody's talking about X. Therefore, you must talk about X. X equals digital transformation. Do people understand what they're saying? Probably not. And, and I had a recent conversation with Charlie Araujo, known to some folks out there, no doubt, uh, one of the founders of the digital trans the Institute for Digital Transformation. He kind of should know what he's talking about. And I said, well, what's your, your definition of digital transformation? He says, you know, almost everybody gets it wrong. It's, it's not about digital. And we're going to talk more about that too. Mm. Digital, take that word. Everybody says, whoa, we've got to go digital. Well, what does that mean? We're already yeah. digital. We're on digital. Well, I've got digits. You have digits. And, yeah. and we're digital now, right? But um, the transformation is the operative word and the phrase. And that's the part that's not getting done. And, and this is a recurring issue in our wonderful IT industry. As you know, right. there's a problem. Let's install some technology to, that will fix it. It never fixes it. It's the swing in the wrong configuration. The customer doesn't get what they want because we're going at it wrong and it doesn't provide the proper solution. So I, I think that that's kind of a cycle that goes around and around and around. But it's part of the distortion, isn't it? That it nuance is, around how we understand what what digital is, um, and and we forget it's still it's still about people. They think it's about technology. Technology yes. is still just the catalyst, right? But ultimately, your goal is to achieve something. And if your exactly. goal is to achieve something, digital are the tools, the yeah. enablers. The yeah. things that give you the power in order to, but unless you as an organization, and I mean systemically, unless you figure out how your organizational system is capable of achieving that end, you're not transforming. Yeah. And I still think, I still think change. part of the distortion or actually even the delusion to some degree is they don't really understand their purpose. Mm -hmm. And if you don't understand your purpose, it all ties you've already distorted the field in which you're working. You've already distorted the, the view of how you are going to go about even achieving what you thought your purpose was because you haven't even clarified that. So I think a lot of people don't know, and I hate to, you know, I'm, I, I'm not trying to accuse CIOs here, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> 
Just I'll, so I'll you know. do it. <laughs> just so you know. Um, but got him again. again. Leading on stereotypes, <laughs> uh, I'm just going to say that you know the, the horror story of of most IT departments is that the CIO goes to a conference yes. somewhere and and comes back and is reading something on the plane. That's always that's the backstory, right? He's reading something on the plane, and it's all fired up about a particular piece of technology because everybody else is going to have it. Yeah. And oh, yeah. there's the SEO effect in operation with regards to the technology so, that people are putting into business. But I have the lightest so, shiny toy. So I, so mm. I, I do see that happening in the CIO space. I, I, I truly, truly do. I also see it happening at other, uh, in, in other areas of the C-suite. Meaning if we're Absolutely. not talking about digital transformation as a corporation, if we're not talking about AI, if we're not talking about whatever those buzz phrases are, then we're not relevant as a business. And so CIOs, um, uh, you know, it's like if I'm not telling you we need to be doing digital transformation, we need to be doing AI, if I'm not saying those things, then maybe I'm not a relevant or, or capable CIO. And so, of course, I have to be on, you know, the SEO points, as, as you put it. But I think it's important that we recognize that and maybe the CIO knows that. And, and knows they have to do that. But then you'll have other parties in the C-suite who aren't digitally literate enough to understand the meaning behind what the CIO is trying to achieve. And you know, we, so, we, we work with groups of leaders and when we're working with groups of leaders, I'm often reminding them, you have three levels of commit, commitment you can make, right? When it comes to digital literacy and understanding what you're signing off on. And uh, you have the opportunity to take a deep dive, deep enough to understand um, effort and what that involves. But you also, you know, see C-suite executives who say, yes, we buy in, but it's not my problem. Show me the map. And others who are just um, hungry for the vendor buzz, right? Yeah. They, they're hungry for the vendor buzz. So they're saying, but yeah, you know, I'm Patty, sign I, off, I, but I'm not committed. So there are know, three levels of commitment in yeah. understanding what you actually are getting as it relates to the business outcome. So Patty, what I want to do is get you to just go a bit further in what we're seeing on the screen here. It's important to tie the technology to business outcomes. What you described to me is such a common issue where um, you know the, the CIO communication around the technology and, and what it really means in terms of business outcomes, there's still, and we still see, and it's not a delusion issue, it's a distortion. It's part of the distortion because yeah. the language barrier and the way we discuss it doesn't always meet. It's like when we saw on the slides so, with the swing, we don't always talk the way that needs to be so that we're on the same page. So that's organizational change and transformation 101, right, is communicating the future state and where we're going. And it's often left out. I would agree with you. Or it's left to interpretation. I'll give you a one-liner and then it's left to interpretation, right? So um, that's, that's the distortion. Yeah. Well, yeah, so I would suggest that, that startup organizations have a real advantage over ex organizations that have existed for a period of time. And the reason for that is because they don't have a status quo to break. There's a clear objective. We are going to sell this product. We're going to transform this. We're going to, you know, like think of things like Uber or, you know, Airbnb or, and I, I don't want to exclude some really good examples, but the idea that we, there's this new startup model that had no legacy. And everybody was focused on that. And in as far as that required technology, got it. We know how we can contribute to that. When it related to business relationships with other organizations, uh, legal and regulatory, all of that, everybody is focused on achieving that goal. But once you've been in an operation for a period of time, maybe a few decades, is you think you understand how businesses run. And that's where those boxes start getting more and more clear and you're disconnected from the outcomes. So the disconnect, no, Patty, the disconnect oh, I was is say in the innovation space, right? Yes. So yeah. you've got, um, you've got a there's a life cycle to businesses. When you're in startup mode, you are in innovation mode, and so right. you are gung ho about creating that vision. Once you move to maintenance and operational mode, a lot of people assume that you can do any kind of transformation, managing the transformation the same way you do 
in <laughs> manage yeah. op maintenance and operation mode, right? right? And so we've got people in maintenance and operation who've never actually innovated who are being asked to transform an organization on the side of their desk. It doesn't Okay, work. so on that point, Perry, That's this brilliant. is where I want to get to before, after what just Greg said, leading into what you've got here on the screen, um, which is something that we, we, we've we all often said, you know, it, it's like, um, you know, we're, if it's no longer viable, you know, we've got to kill it off. We've talked a lot about legacy systems. And excuse me, I am in the countryside, tractor going by. I, unlike Roy's, that's the 1057 train. <laughs> So, um oops here we go i hope i can hear you can hear me talking we over that oh, we barely really hear the great. background we almost hear none of the background yeah yeah i think that's my my neighbor francis anyway so um but when we talk about this in terms of viability so often because we've and this is part of i think it's part of the distortion not so much delusion but we uh, have sunk so much into particular legacy systems and legacy, mm -hmm. not just technology. We've got the legacy policies, the legacy processes, the way, you know, even legacy right. culture. So this yes, minimally yes, yes. viable, if it is not viable, um, we have to get to a point where we understand what that level of viability is and make the hard choice. You know, guys, quite frankly, that process isn't working. Kick it out or shift it, change it in some way. Um, the same with the technology, the same with the so policies. As soon as, as, soon as you said that, though, policies. Simone, as soon as you said that, you know, and you've been there, so I'm not telling you anything no. you don't know. As soon as you say that this process isn't working, this policy is legacy, you're stepping on somebody's emotional connection and exactly. somebody's very identity. Exactly. Uh, so I, and that's I did a, where that, and that's where that ability with emotional intelligence that Patty and I keep banging on about and, and understanding it and this competency around Around helping people understand where their place is in this that it's not that it's wrong it's just that we've shifted it's just that it's now different and helping them understand what the art of the possible is how so we I get think, them to I see i think we need to understand what now. characteristics of agile and nimble mm -hmm. actually are right so if if and and i don't nest i don't mean agile the approach necessarily but agile the um cultural attitude okay so so small a as opposed to big a but the but the idea is that you have to understand that um, technology is not your living room couch. You didn't buy it so that it would last the next 26 years. Yes, I did. Right? So <laughs> you, you did it. <laughs> and you couch potato, Netflix and weirdo. <laughs> if you as an organization know you have to move forward, maybe you can't afford to be able to do the whole shebang at once, which is right. what we talk about when we're talking about minimum viable product, right? But it's still got to be viable. So you can't take, you can't be agile toward nothing that is actually going to be functional for you, right? And yeah. you have to recognize that technology is not a couch. It is a dynamic, moving, growing, exponential thing that is going to keep your business relevant. And it takes commitment and investment on an ongoing, continuous, you know, absolutely. Movement. And right. and that whole idea of viability is really, and there's a combination of that that's being discussed a lot, especially in the current environment where we're moving forward, two steps back, another step forward, two steps back. We are in such a flux uh, environment right now, even in business, that this ability to understand what is viable to us right now in this moment, this is what's working. But you know, and I'm not kidding, even in two weeks time, that the viability of that process or policy or technology can shift, you know, it, what's the old phrase, it turns on a dime. You know, and, and that ability to be able to build in the resilience and uh, that agility and art of the possible is so important right now. Not, And you know what? It's not just to the sustainability of business currently. It's also to their ability to thrive. 
And that's that what you were speaking about, Simone, about the importance of experimentation and testing mm -hmm. and ongoing moving forward. And, Absolutely. And, yeah. yeah. So, so one of the one of the things that I, I've really come to, to see very, very clearly is agility is not an IT thing. Um, so there's been a tremendous amount of focus in the agile kind of mindset around IT. And the reason is traditionally IT has not been capable for many reasons, um, you know, not, not mostly through fault in, in, in processes, but just simply the limitations on what it is that we're doing. But now we have uh, incredibly automated build, test, deployment, et cetera. So we now have a capability. Well, here's the thing. If you think about the theory of constraints is you fix the bottleneck. Right. And so there's been for the last, let's say, 10 years, uh, just for round numbers, there's been a tremendous focus on the ability of an IT organization to respond quickly. We've now uh, re reached the point where organizations don't know what to do with that level of capability. Is it okay that we're making a thousand changes to our core applications a day? Do our customers need that? Are we creating the right experience? Do we know where our business needs to go? And so the constraint is no longer the agility of the IT organization, at least in leading organization. The constraint is at the mindshare, at the head of corporations to figure out what problem are we trying to solve? Let, well, and so the very the idea that there's yeah, but let me come back to the strengths because one of my one of my uh, early mentors and one of my favorite people, Ivor McFarlane, and we we talk a, a lot about uh, I I like to talk about what I call sandbox thinking. Now some people think sandbox that's the tests place that you put everything, you know, the sandbox place place, and it is exactly that. But I look at it from a different perspective. I use I use sandbox thinking from what are our constraints? Now you could have a miniature sandbox, you know, the, the little kid sandbox that you might put in your yard where you, you could put up four pieces of square wood, make a square space, throw some sand in, you know, hammer the corners together with some nails. And, that, and that's fine, you, that's your play space. And you have some constraints there because you might get some splinters. You've got to be careful that you've done the nails the right way. They could be rusty. So there's your risks and, and that kind of stuff. But inside of that, you can create whatever you like, you know, because you've got this fluid movement, you, you can create that. But your sandbox might also be a beach. You could have a whole beach, but you're still going to have the cliffs and the rocks and whatever's, well, in Australia, of course, whatever's living inside the rock pools, um, which you shouldn't really go poking about right. in. So when you, um, when you attend... see, see what I mean? Like you, so you're always going to have the constraints, but your ability is, can I actually shift and move those constraints? What is like the tide is in and out? Or if there's a policy that we currently have at the moment, are we able to loosen that policy in the current environment or do we need to tighten it? So the shape is not necessarily square or round or your environment. You've got to ask the question. Yes. So there's this there's this um, understanding that when I go to the beach with my children, I have to understand everyone's mental models and the children have to understand mine. So that means what, um, what do we believe about this outing? <laughs> what are our thresholds? What are our defined thresholds under which we are going to play? How are we playing in the sandbox and what happens when someone throws sand? Um, and then that open-minded, human-centered design piece where we are yeah. we actually talking to everyone about the experience we're trying to achieve? If this is the outcome, how does that impact everyone else, right? And that's where we get into um, how do we remove some of the delusion, remove some of the distortion? Well, that's by setting specific things, telling stories, having the opportunity to define it a little bit better. So if you're going to ask, and thanks for the slide, Roy, what if, then you need to ask, okay, what if we were to do this? If that's our outcome, how might we do it? So we look at telling the stories across the organization, and then we gather insights from that to help set goals and direction, right? Yeah, and that what That's if is a really important thing, because that what if is about driving that underneath uh, curiosity. That's that uh, possibility. You know, as, as long as we've got the psychological safe space to sort of play with the ideas and 
you know, what if this, what if that, it doesn't matter what methods or technologies you could use around this, you know, whether you're whiteboarding or, or post-it noting or, you know, what, whatever it is that you use in your techniques that work with your culture, but just asking that question to have the curiosity, it's a safe space in which you can play with the idea without the consequences. So the idea isn't just though asking what if, the idea exactly. is hearing other people's what if. So if you mm -hmm. if you say what if to someone, you're going to see eight different routes on the same map toward a location, right? It's understanding the stories behind those routes, sure. why they would want to go that way. And once we begin to do that, we gain common insights. And it's the common insights that help us set a direction that um, includes information and knowledge from different parts of the organization so that IT isn't stuck with both the responsibility and the fault that lies with how we got there. And you know, <laughs> that picks up on what we've talked previously in previous episodes about storytelling and the people's experiences. Very important. Because that what if, bringing in that workshop side of saying, well, what if we did it this way? And they say, oh, no, that won't work here. We've tried that before. Yes, but what was different about why it worked at one other place and it didn't work here? And that opens up that exploratory channel uh, yeah, yeah. And, and you have to get at that with an open mind. And when you ask the question, how might we, it, it creates an open door of creativity for people, even under the constraints. So then when you come in and say, even if, when you set constraints like you've described them, Simone, that gives the opportunity for people to say, but how might we within this uh, parameter exactly. that we, within which this play space this is what I've got so I think even if it's so what if is one of my favorite things because that's what opens up the curiosity that's what sort of really allows people to dive in and say oh you know if I could treat if if you, I didn't have the constraints if I didn't have the barriers and then there says all the objections it, and and all of you, you, all of you guys here, you've all experienced it. We've been there when they've said, oh, but we can't do that because of this and because of that and whatever the case might be. So mm. as all these objections arise, it's say, okay, so even if we have this situation, what can we still achieve? Because we still have the sandbox to play in. And who said that you just, okay, the, the, the little box with the little crenellations, let's pour the sand and water in and, and, and there's our little simple sandcastle. I mean, if you've ever looked at the sand sculpting competitions that go on around the world, who said a sandcastle had to look like that? It could look like this. So, so, so yeah. you said some really important things in there that, that I want to go back and emphasize. You talked about psychological safe space um, and, 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 and creativity and, and, and uh, you know, opening our minds. I'm going to suggest that an organization that is not agile by nature, and I mean the C-suite and all the way down, those that don't fully buy into that as a culture are creating a tension because people naturally individuals are naturally inquisitive, I think. I think they're naturally inventive and they want to do something that makes a difference. So when you're getting missed messages, we want to be an inventive company and then we make, quote, a mistake, you know? And then it's like, I don't want any more mistakes like that, you don't know? Don't screw up uh, like that again. You know, you know <laughs> yeah, exactly. You shut down the creativity, you shut right. down the innovation. And so, and so there's been a, a heavy emphasis in our industry, and, and, and I'll just leave it at that, but there's been a heavy industry, a heavy emphasis on what individuals should be doing and thinking and behaving like, you know, self-organization. We should be inventive and creative and, you know, breaking rules and that, 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 that. And I say, that's only true if your organization has a context that supports that. Otherwise, you're in you're in contrast with what the governing body okay, has so, said. This so, is what so we did. So let me do. bring in the phrase then. Let me bring in the phrase safe to fail experiments. Well, so safe to fail. There's there there are people that have the purse strings and the power structures that they can determine whether it's safe to fail or not. And and you know, you say, hey, just go do, you know, great things, good things will happen. 
you do. And then there's, there's consequences, meaning, uh, you know, it's not safe to fail. Now, nobody believes that it's safe to fail. Right? Okay, okay, so I'm going to pick doing... up on something. Sorry, sorry Pat. I'm just going to pick up on something that, um, you know, as part of the research around all of this that I've really focused on, uh, and it does come from, you know, Kinevan framework and the sense making frameworks that are uh, 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 complexity thinking um, that's being talked about. Um, it's really interesting because the majority are the engineers and we used it with the, the cartoons early on is that they design things not to fail. That, that's mm -hmm. the purpose, you know, they design mm -hmm. things not to fail. Whereas when we look at from a social engineering perspective uh, or a more scientific perspective, we experiment expecting a failure and to learn from that and to create something better. Right. And if so and there's if you, a very different thinking style between an engineering or I think a real systems engineering focus versus to the more social or make <laughs> sense making style of thinking. I, I think my friends at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute would take a slight issue with with part of that, Simone. They would say engineers design things to fail predictably. Hmm. They want to know exactly <laughs> where that point of failure uh, uh, is. Yeah, because Absolutely. there's always a stressor point. There's always some, you know, there, there yeah. are always going to be those factors that we have to account for, which is part of the risk management side, right? So yeah. so yeah. I, I, I don't want to hammer on this point, but I do want to make it very, very clear is I, I completely get and agree all that. What I see less of is organizational leaders who truly understand what it takes to be an agile, innovative, self-organizing uh, team where people are free to do that. The level of commitment to do that is uh, probably exceeds the average executive who's been in a position for more than a couple of decades. It probably exceeds their ability because they think of risk. They think of uh, lack of control. They think of, of you know, uh, accountabilities being applied by the board of directors, et cetera. And so it's a rare, rare breed that really can truly make good on creating a culture for people to do that. And this brings me back to, I think that startups have a, a unique uh, advantage over others because they start with that in mind. And I know that they go through the cycles, Patty, it's, it's, it's exactly what you do. But if you're not towing baggage or have organizational politics or, or risk factors or, you know, don't don't cross this particular VP, but but this one over here might be a little different. Those create an environment where we're stymied. And I believe that when you have a leadership team who says, I want innovation, I want this company to be agile, but doesn't show the level of commitment to do that. That's where you have distortion and probably delusion. Okay, so I'm going to segue to Patty on that. With with Patty, I want your view on this because I'm going to put a caveat. I've been trying to talk what, for a while. What, sorry, I know, I know, it's, so sad, it's, it's like, all exciting. It's such an exciting topic. But 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 Patty, this is where I want to just segue from Greg's to yours on this. Is on this point that people can see on the screen intellectual honesty. I truly do not see where we are teaching or there is enough, uh, I don't know, gumption, is gumption the right word, of, of some of the levels in the leadership area that they're pushing back so we have this intellectual honesty to really be able to move forward. So I've been doing this for about 12 years and I've been in and out of an awful lot of organizations. <laughs> And, 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 you know, we always laugh internally, we will talk about who's our, who's our best client and our best client is the, the client that's already doing the work. Yeah. So, um, but, but what we have discovered over the last 12 years and working with organizations, those that are, um, uh, who wrap their arms around the status quo, and then those who are enlightened, which are opposite ends of the, of the spectrum, the ones that hang on to the status quo, hang on to it due to a lack of experience in anything else. And so we find that if we can at least open the door to the possibility of what can happen experientially for um, even just with a small design thinking exercise for helping them with strategy or helping them with something, and we can dig deep into why it was better this time 
than the last time they tried it without taking this kind of open-minded growth mindset approach, without addressing the mental models, without doing, you know, we can say, here's what happened, yeah. here's where you got, and here's why we're doing strategy again. Let's experience something different. Open up your minds for this one exercise. And then we have the opportunity to take leaders a little bit further and say, what if we could do this? Now, when you look at design thinking, I have seen projects that have tried to accomplish something and taken three and a half months of emails back and forth and useless meetings without, a, without outcomes and all of this kind of stuff to get nowhere. And then we can take an entire organizational um, approach for strategy, say, and we can bring people in over a period of a week, and we can do it in a week, accomplish what they can do in three months. We get a lot of fight back on, oh, hold on a minute, you want a week of anyone's time? We, we're, we're just far too busy for that. And then mm -hmm. they realize the effort in taking that agile approach. Once you experience it, it changes the game. And, and so, Greg, to your point, it is almost impossible unless you can get someone to experience the value behind um, the mental models, the sense making, the um, the design thinking process, the you know all of that. Unless you can get someone to experience it, you're right. You're going to have an organization that's stymied. But that doesn't stop you from doing that in your pocket of happiness. Oh, I agree with oh, that. I, I love it when you use that phrase and, all the and, time. I love well, it when you do that. So, so that is one of the big takeaways that I have from my time as a CIO is because I can't change the organization as fast or as far as I would like to be able to, my responsibility is to be that shield that says my organization, I'm going to create a culture where if there are consequences, et cetera, that hits on me and I don't pass it along, right? Like let's create that space uh, mm -hmm. where people can actually be successful in that. So I totally agree with that. Um, I, 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 I think, I think one of the, the the key phrases for executive leadership is this is not the same thing, only different. And adult learning is is as if you if you've studied it, is adults uh, process new ideas by connecting it or associating it with previously understood ideas, and that's dangerous in the case of creating a brand new exploratory culture because it is not the same thing, only different. You you would be better off to create a whole new paradigm of that, and that's very difficult to do. And I it think is. I think to some extent, the more successful one has been as a leader in an organization or a manager in an organization, probably the harder it is to change your perspective on what it is that you should be doing. That do you know what? That takes Sorry, us Patty, back to our title, Simone, because when you look at um, when you look at complexity and degrees of complexity, if you're saying we're this and we want to be this, and you're six degrees out from where this is, and we've talked about that before, you can only go one or two degrees out. So you need to actually phase it's learning and mental models in a, in a way that is realistic. To yeah. say we want to be all of this, and we're going to give three to six months to do it, and we're going to try and change the mindsets so of, unrealistic. you know, 80 so different leaders, right? You've got to <laughs> yeah. take it into, into steps and places. And when yeah. we talk about transformation, you have to be very realistic on the capacity for people to adopt right. and change. And that really is about that reality distortion field. If we can just go back one please, Roy, on, no, on no, what I've got we there. Can't, we can't, I can't go backwards. We, we have to move forward. We're always going be, forward. Okay, you are the time tunnel master. <laughs> we, we You've been to able be to go the, forwards and backwards in, in, yeah. in any era ever. Just call me Dr. What? <laughs> <laughs> wait, what? Sorry. Uh, wait, what? So is that, um, is that, does Dr. Watt ride in the Turtis or the Tardis? <laughs> <laughs> the the Tardis. Wow, we are um, we are going all the way back to the beginning. Thank you, Patty. Tur Turtles um, all the way down. No, uh, anyway, so what I was actually thinking as you guys were talking about that is exactly this. And it always reminds me because, you know, I, I have uh, facilitated and done a lot of those like Apollo 13 simulation game stuff. So when we talk about that psychological safe space and playing and figuring things out, and it's very true, unless you actually experience what it feels like to do something, it's very difficult. And 
I, and I have to say, and, and it's part of, I've always loved my sci-fi and everything else, but I love all the reality around some of uh, the uh, technical movies in regards to space, et cetera, because there's some really scary stuff that goes on in this. I mean, you just have to look at, you know, The Martian and, and one of my favorites, Mission to Mars. There's a lot of stuff that goes on there that is so relevant and relatable to the way we plan and design and do what we do. And one of the things that, you know, always um, I remember is we have to be so careful when we're making these decisions in terms of not too careful, we still have to move forward, but we have to be aware that what's the angle at that we're coming from in this, because is it a complete delusion or is it just slightly distorted? Because that will make a difference from, you know, if we're coming in from space, if the angle's wrong, we skip off and like we're bouncing off. That's the, the we're, we're out there. And you know what? We ain't coming back. You can, Sometimes you can skate along and for some organizations that that is okay for the time being to skate along on an environment or in a particular situation, you know, just hanging in there. Um, that's okay for a while, but do you know what? You, you, you're going to have to, there's going to be a point where if you're not on the right angle, you're going to burn up or you're going to make the landing. So there's going to be a point around that where that happens and I've seen it too many times in the mergers and acquisitions in the sustainability versus survivability versus thrivability. Okay. I think there's so, a, there's, there's a certain talking about space and, you know, failure is not an option. The famous phrase. Failure is Gucci. not an option. And, and that's a very, it's a very interesting thing that, you know, there are actually very few cases uh, in any business where that's true. We like to think it's true, but failure really is an option. And even <laughs> it when it's a critical business operation, failure is okay. Mm -hmm. Not in, you know, certain medical fields and things like that, where somebody can die on the other end, but most business operations are not that critical. We like to pump ourselves up and say, well, if, if this fails, everything's going to go horribly wrong and the world will end. <laughs> not so much. Um, so, so that's one thing. Failure usually is an option. And I, and I, w one of the reason that some people enjoy activities that where failure is, is really not an option, like jumping out of planes. Uh, for me, it was moderated a little bit, you know, riding motorcycles is, is one of my things. And, and if you, if you make mistake on a motorcycle, things go really bad, really Real fast. fast. Uh, so, so, so that kind of thing is it requires a certain level of concentration and understanding what those critical risks are. Um, and I think that, that that gets lost a lot of times in, in our business lives. And just what are those, if you could define in three things, what, what really means, what's really critical for your business and how can you deliver those three things on a, on a reasonably stable basis with a whole new way of thinking underneath it. Now we're talking about digital transformation. We're talking about new ways of delivering what the customer wants, as we talked about in the beginning. Uh, maybe it's not ropes in a tree, right? At all. Right. Maybe we have to rethink that whole thing and come back yeah. to the customer and hold up the sketch and say, what do you think of this? But that's the important part that gets lost a lot too, is we don't go back to the customer and say, what do you think of this? Have what that I've heard, dialogue. Yeah, and what I'm hearing today is like, wait, um, it's not enough to believe the buzz of the vendor, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> right? There's a, certain, there's a certain effort um, uh, and detail required so that you can pull yourself out of delusion because the buzz of the vendor is diluting. It makes you assume some things um, without the understanding of the effort involved. Distortion um, for me, um, occurs often when we think we're transforming, but we're actually creating a transactional effort within the organization. We're adding a tool, we're changing something out, we're doing, but we're not changing how we do our business, just like you said, Roy, right? Um, and then, and then the opportunity to recognize that failure is an attitude that, um, that does not create agility. Learning 
is what creates the agility. So when you're experimenting and we talk about fail fast, what we're talking about is, okay, that didn't work, but what did we learn from it? So we can jump off onto that to, to, to be able to create that viability, right? And uh, the word failure bothers me because it isn't failure ever if you are an organization that is willing to take the learning, right? If you're willing to learn from that. Um, and, and the how might we and the what ifs and the art of possibility that Simone talks about, um, when you look at the inclusionary model in there, oftentimes if you're going to do any effort, when you don't do it cross-functionally, you are not creating the possible. You are simply performing a transaction. Exactly. So, I, so I my summary on this time. is the three R's. I have three R's that I like to do around this. This is my, my little ending point or key takeaway for you guys. And um, I usually like to call it relax, recharge, and revive. The relax is we're just going to refine what we're doing. You know, it's just the incremental improvements. We're still doing the same stuff. We're just going to increment and improve it. And, that, and there's nothing wrong with that. Build that into your norm. You always want to do things a little bit better every time. So that's my refine. And that's more a relaxed focus. Um, if I think about recharge, um, is more about we're going to start on the transformational path. We're still going to be doing the same things, but we're going to do it a different way. So for me, that's more the re-engineering, okay? That, that's, that's more, we're going to re-engineer the way we do what we do, but it's still the same stuff. But it's still, we, we've now begun that focus on, on, on transformation. But the final R, the revive, and I think revive sounds weird. It sounds like, okay, I've already killed you. I've got to do the CPR and let's go. But, you know, for some organizations, that is exactly the feeling and where they're at. They're like, oh, okay, we're going to just completely do this so differently now. And so the revive is what we call rethink. That is now we have to completely kibosh what we've been doing. We've got to get into that sandbox. We're going to really recreate. We have to completely do something differently now. So they're my three R's. So I, as I said, relax, recharge, and revive. But it's about the refine, the re-engineer, and the revive. That 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 whole rethink. So so the remarkable Mark, Mark Thomas stopped by today, and I, I call him remarkable because, as you can see, when we talk, our mouths move and things like that. But Mark <laughs> is able to hold that exact expression for an entire hour. It's yeah, unbelievable. So, uh, Mark, oh, don't even do it. <laughs> I, I just told Greg, I, I'm, I have to go to a client call, but I wanted to hear the last R before I left. Oh yeah. my God. Oh, my God. oh I awesome. kept you hanging. I love it when I keep you hanging. You guys, thank you. I, I enjoy listening to this every time. I just, just so you guys know, you, you know, when I told you this uh, a few weeks ago that I actually uh, went and binged every one of these things and just, I have it on in the background as I'm working. And it's not that I'm not paying attention. It's just fun to listen to the conversation and you pick up notes and things. And, and this has been very helpful. And I hope a lot of your other listeners are, are getting the same stuff because it, it's just, it's enjoyable. It's a comfortable conversation. I, I appreciate it guys. And, and that's, that's what I do is I, I listen to you guys and I look over every once in a while and I'm listening in. So anyway, it's not that I'm not a hundred percent checked in. It's just, it's, so, so what was your big, what was your big thing from, from this one? What, what kind of sort of stuck? I, so you, I knew you were going to put me on the spot I know. on this. Yeah. And the only Always. reason, the only reason I can't expand on is because I literally have to jump on a call. Uh, but, but I will say, I, I really liked the, the kind of idea when, when perception came up. Um, and I think that perception is a, is a big deal in business right now. And you guys talked about that. Uh, I think Patty brought up the whole, you know, that kind of perception thing. And I think that's that's important because, you know, in the context of business, you know, it's everybody's perception is different. And so therefore there are different expectations and so on. I really I really like that conversation early uh, in the show. So, yeah, that was Thanks one of the for big joining things. Us, of course, Mark. Oh, yeah. yeah. And of course, I hung it. around for the three R's and that's yeah. it. I was like, yes. <laughs> that's awesome. 
All right, guys. Now, thank you. Go, go, go away, Mark. Go take care of your client, and we'll see you sometime down the road. See you guys. Thank you. Bye. See you later, Alligator. It's and, and, and look, while we're still recording here and, and streaming to YouTube, uh, let us say that other people are welcome to do that. If you're on LinkedIn, uh, take a gander. Uh, we do post about KTLO and how you can participate. And uh, we love to have you stop by. If you're watching the live stream on YouTube, thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, so what is it? What, what, what do we call this particular? Oh, wait a minute. It's called KTLO. Keeping, Keeping the, the learning, learning on. on. <laughs>